Hello and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today we're very pleased to bring you the latest in our E4C's 2014 webinar series. Today's webinar was developed in collaboration with Pamela Roussos, who is the Director of Strategic Alliances at the Center of Science, Technology, and Society at Santa Clara University. My name is Paul Scott, and I will be moderating today's webinar. When I'm not doing this, I'm, I work with ASME, and I'm the program manager for the ASME Engineering Social Innovation Program, an initiative focused on providing the advice, finance, networks needed for social ventures to navigate their engineering journey. I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a little bit about today's webinar. Engineering trends in the world of social entrepreneurship, social enterprises scaling impact. Social entrepreneurs are instrumental agents in the development and delivery of technology-based solutions. So at E4C, we're particularly interested in the trends influencing this community. To aid this effort, we've invited today's presenter, Pamela Roussos, who is the Director of Strategic Alliances at Santa Clara University. We thank you for joining us today. Before we get rolling, I'd like to take a moment to recognize the coordinators of the E4C webinar series generally. Jana Aranda of ASME, Holly Schneider-Brown, Victoria Chung, Jackie Halliday, and Alex Torres of IEEE, who work on developing and delivering the webinar series. Thank you, team. If anyone out there has questions about the series or would like to make a recommendation for future topics and speakers, we invite you to connect with us via the email address visible on the slide, webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Before we hand things over to our presenter today, we thought it would be good to remind you about Engineering for Change and who we are. E4C is a global community of over 18,000 technically minded members and more than 60,000 social media followers, such as engineers, technologists, representatives from NGOs, and social scientists, who are working together to solve critical humanitarian challenges faced by underserved communities around the world today, whether in water, energy, health, agriculture, or sanitation. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. E4C membership provides cost-free access to a growing inventory of field-tested solutions and related information from all the members of our coalition, including professional societies like ASME, IEEE, ASCE, SWE, and ASHRAE, and academic supporters like MIT DLAB, international development agencies like USAID, Engineering Without Borders USA, and Practical Action, as well as access to passionate, engaged communities working to make people's lives all over the world. Registration is easy, and it's free. Check out our website at engineeringforchange.org to learn more and to sign up. The webinar you are participating in today is one installment of Engineering for Change webinar series. This free, publicly available series of online seminars showcase the best practices and thinking of leaders in the field who bring innovative technology and solutions to bear on global humanitarian and development challenges. Information on upcoming installments in the series, as well as archived videos of past presentations, can be found on the E4C webinar webpage, engineeringforchange.webinars.org. If you're following us on Twitter, I'd also like to invite you to join the conversation with hashtag E4C webinars. E4C's next webinar will be on March, will be in March at 11 a.m. EST on topics of advances in household water treatment products and standards. Our speakers will be curated by Ryan Rowe of the renowned University of North Carolina Water Institute. So stay tuned for E4C webinars pages for updates on the presenters and registration details. If you're already an E4C member, we will be sending you an invitation to the webinar soon. A few housekeeping items before we get started. 
Let's see where everyone in the world is today. In the chat window, please type your location. So we have some people from New York in the USA. We've got uh, some members from Toronto in Canada, Denver, Colorado. Do we have anyone from outside the US? I think we have some part participants from uh, London, England, and from Canada. Some participants from Barcelona in Spain. And and colleagues on the line from Holland and the Netherlands. If you have any technical questions or administrative problems uh, during today's web webinar, please go into the chat window and feel free to send a private message to Jackie Halliday. You can also use the chat window to type any remarks you may have during the webinar. Please use the question and answer window located below the chat window to, to type your questions for the presenter. If you are listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any troubles, try hitting stop and start. If that doesn't work, you can use the call-in number for the tele teleconference. You may also want to try opening WebEx in a different browser. Following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour for this session, please follow the instructions on the top of our web page. Now a little bit about today's presenter. Family Russos um, has worked with and for early stage software companies as a business and marketing strategy leader. She has over 20 years of experience growing teams and delivering products for both large scale and startup software companies working at various managerial capacities as business unit manager, vice president of marketing, COO, and CEO. Pamela has been a mentor for the Global Social Benefit Institute at Santa Clara University for five years. She also serves on the board of PACT, an international NGO that benefits communities by promoting healthy lifestyle, decent livelihoods, and sustainable natural resources. Pamela, we're very happy to have you with us today, and we look forward to hearing from you. And with that, I'll pass it over to Pamela Russo. Thanks, Paul. Uh, good day, everyone. I appreciate you being here. Um, so I actually started my professional career as an engineer. And I, uh, I, was, I was a software development engineer, my degrees in computer science. And while I really enjoyed um, building things, um, I was really curious about how people made uh, buying decisions. And so I um, moved over to the dark side and went into, onto the business side, as you saw uh, from the bio that, uh, that Paul was just showing you. And about six years ago, I was having dinner with a friend and was kind of saying, you know, there's got to be more to life than just slinging software, as I said. was. Um, and you know, there's got to be meaning. Um, and so my friend introduced me to uh, the Global Social Benefit Institute, the GSBI, and um, and my life has been um, has been on a, a different trajectory. And the reason I bring that up is because I think we're all on a journey, and the fact that you are all on this call with us today um, shows that you're really interested in social justice and social change. So the Global Social Benefit Institute, uh, the GSBI, is an incubator and an accelerator that's run out of Santa Clara University. Um, we've been around for more than 10 years. Uh, we've uh, worked with over 200 uh, social entrepreneurs around the world. And so that's really given us a lot of uh, views and, and, and being able to see what's going on and some of the trends. And so we'll be talking about those today and, and what you know we see as um, some of the impediments and some of the barriers that we need to get around in order to um, continue to scale um, these uh, social entrepreneurs in order for them to do the good work that they want to be doing um, in the world. So um, the GSBI with, at the center, uh, we, have a, we sit in the middle of Silicon Valley, and so like many Silicon Valley companies, we have our BHAG, our big, hairy, audacious goal, which is to positively impact the lives of a billion people by the year 2020. 
So, you know, there is a lot of need um, in, um, in the world. There's uh, about 4 billion people today living on less than $3 a day. And you can see the, um, the statistics on the slides here, but, you know, we still have major issues around sanitation and water, and I know that you've been having webinars around some of these issues, uh, clean energy, um, the fact that there's lack of market access for uh, so many of the smallholder farmers around the world, and then, you know, illiter illiteracy, things that we just take for granted are missing from the lives of billions and billions of people. And um, if you look at projections in the growth, um, by the year 2020, we're going to be adding two more billion people um, to this planet. And if we don't do something about poverty and try to eradicate poverty, that would mean that two-thirds of the planet would be living in poverty. And so this is a call to action for many, uh, for many of us. And so if you, you look at some of the theories of change that have happened throughout the years, you have what I um, will call the paternalistic uh, classic development par paradigm. Um, and that, you know, clearly hasn't, it hasn't worked. It's, it's just chipping away at things and, and then who knows? I mean, there's a lot of um, arguments about whether or not that's a persistent change, um, that it's sustainable change. Um, you have those that uh, say that the government should be taking care of this problem, and then others that are saying, well, no, actually, it's the big multinational corporations that should be, because at the bottom of the pyramid, there's just so much, there's so many people, as I was just talking about, four billion, that that's such a huge market opportunity that these big multinationals should be, um, uh, you know, addressing this. And so, um, and through time, we've come up, um, and, and the, the idea of social entrepreneurship um, has, has emerged. And so, when we talk about social entrepreneurs, um, we're talking about people that are passionate, passionate about solving social issues. They could be running for profits or nonprofits, um, and, and they're looking at using um, market-based approaches in order to solve these problems. So you might have heard of double bottom line and triple bottom line businesses. Those are people, those are social entrepreneurs. They're not so just focused on one single bottom line, which is profit. Like many of the companies, I'm sitting here in New York City now, and if you think about lots of the companies that sit at the bottom of Manhattan on the, uh, of the island, they're all focused on profit and profitability. Whereas social entrepreneurs are also focused on uh, people and or place, so uh, around communities, people, um, and then or natural resources and, and the environment. And so these are people that are agents of change and really wanting, like I said, to, to uh, make a difference in the world. Um, if you look at, um, at the landscape in 2003 when we were just getting formed, um, there weren't that many um, organizations around. Um, in fact, actually, the GSBI came out of um, the Tech Awards in Silicon Valley, they've been running Tech Awards for, um, for a number of years. And what was happening was these technology people that were coming, you know, so solving a social issue, whether it was clean cook stoves or solar lighting or thing, things like that, when we looked at them a year or two years after they had won their awards, they were either not, on, not in business or still really struggling and not really making a difference in, in the world. And what we saw um, was that what was needed um, was more than just the technology. And so we have um, created this uh, framework um, at, at the GSBI, and, it, and, me, and it, it's all together that it's a technology that needs to come together, um, it's a business model that needs to work, and it needs to all, all come together in the local context. That, you know, it, if you think about technology um, as a specific thing like a, a water filter or a solar light, but it also the, the technology could be in support of a service. So, for instance, a social entrepreneur that is trying to solve cataract issues um, and, and be able to uh, remove cataracts, well, first of all, you, you, you need technology to be able to identify and, and, um, the cataracts and detect the cataracts. So, so whether um, an organization, a social enterprise, is, is focused on delivering technology itself 
or using technology as a part of the service that it's delivering. Um, these things need to come together. Like I said, they need to come together in a business model. It needs to be able to make sense in terms of be exactly the be the product that um, that the customer and the consumer needs. It needs to be. Um, able to work from the economics point of view, and then, like I said, it all needs to sit um, uh, in the local context. For instance, if you're putting together um, a water uh, transportation system, and in the communities it is the women that are um, are fetching the water, then you need to be able to put to get put a, a system in place that women can either carry or deal with. Um, so it's really understanding the local context in order to, um, to uh, make sure that your, your solution is long-lived and is sustainable. So at the GSBI, we've, we've taken this, these three um, pillars, if you will, um, the technology, the business model, and the local context. And then we've also taken a sector focus. And then what that allows us to do is kind of understand and go deep um, in some sectors and really understand, uh, um, you know, like I said, go deep um, in these. And let me use the energy sector as a, an example. We've worked with over um, 60 social, uh, social enterprises at this point in time in clean energy. And so we've learned a lot um, in the clean energy space. For instance, one of our uh, alumni is Husk Power, and what they're doing is, is sol solving, um, you know, off-grid energy, uh, off-grid energy problem in India. Um, and in fact, actually, they're uh, just about to expand to to Africa. But you know, so what they've done, so they've co they've kind of come up, sorry, with technology to solve this. Um, but it, from a business model point of view, they've actually done this by, um, by and they've played with this. It, it took them a while to, to get to where they're at now, but um, now they're using a monthly fee, and it's based on the levels of, of energy that are being consumed. And then it's put in the local context because they are using rice husks. They, so you have rice, the rice is being eaten, but the husks weren't, nothing, nothing was being done with those. And so it was just waste. Um, and so now what Husk Power has done is taken that, what was considered waste, and, um, and, and making it useful to, to communities. We've worked with a number of solar uh, lighting companies, and you know whether they're mi using uh, solar lighting or solar for microgrids or for lamps or for mobile chargers, and so you know there are different technologies coming together. And many of our alumni have kind of struggled with: Are we just a technology company, or do we or do we need to distribute? And how far up and down the value chain do we uh, do we go? And so what we've noticed is that we actually have other alumni now that have, have come in and seen that there are inefficiencies or holes in the uh, supply chain of these kinds of products like um, solar lighting and, and clean cook stoves. Um, and so we have organizations like uh, Solar Sister that basically is working with women in rural areas, um, and they uh, are teaching them how to sell uh, uh, solar lighting solutions, and now they're actually just about to add uh, clean, energy, or, uh, clean cook stoves um, as well. So, so they are taking the, uh, the distribution piece of the, uh, of the value chain out of the need for the, um, the technology companies to be doing this, that, that they're filling a hole in the value chain. And they're able to, to again, you know, get close to the communities because the, these women are, are in the communities and, and they can you know, really relate to, um, to, their, to their community members. So, so we see, um, like I said, you know, that's kind of an example of some of you know, how some of these social enterprises are, are you know, really technology focused, but then others are popping up in different parts of the value chain in order for these um, products to really get to market. So um, Village Capital and Andy, which is the Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs, uh, did a study recently, and they, realized, they um, identified the fact that now, in, in 2003, the GSBI was the only incubator um, uh, in the landscape, but now there are 193 uh, 
accelerators and incubators um, around. That they, and what they've seen is that um, the ones that have been around longer actually have a higher success factor. Um, and of course, that's not a surprise. The, as, as I mentioned, you know, we've we've learned a lot over the over 10 years that we've been in business. But um, but also that you know the. the the journey of a, of a social entrepreneur is like a journey of any entrepreneur. It goes through stages. And another report that was done by Monitor identified these stages as blueprint, validate, prepare, and scale. And um, the report uh, identified that a lot of these um, what are called accelerators are really focused on the early part of the life. The blueprint piece um, is when you're ideating, um, you've, you probably are doing a prototype and, and, and you're kind of playing with that to make it work. The validate piece is where I, you know, I think about as being uh, where you're doing a pilot project. You've, you've done the prototype, you have something, now you're going to do a pilot project and figure out um, you know, how, how to make this work in the market. And then, and, and you, as you know, I mean, what you need when you're ideating is different than what you need when you're doing a pilot project, and certainly is different when you're preparing to scale um, your business. And so, making sure that we're supporting, uh, we as a, as incubators and accelerators in the market are su are supporting social entrepreneurs wherever they are in their life cycle here um, is an important aspect. Um, to, to what we're doing and making sure, like I said, that, that these social enterprises can be successful. So as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about uh, the barriers to scaling, and, and we'll go into each one of these but, um, uh, separately, but here's the list of them. Is, um, you know, making sure that we have the appropriate technology solutions, human capital is an issue, as well as the appropriate financial capital, measurement and valuation, and then scaling strategies. So I understand that Radha Basu um, was on, uh, did a webinar for um, for all of you about six months ago. So you might have, some of you might have seen this um, diagram. Um, uh, this is from the Frugal Innovation Lab, which is uh, at Santa Clara University as well. And this really speaks to, um, and, w and when I when we talk about frugal, um, it's not that it's cheap. Um, it has to be appropriate technology. So, um, for instance, it needs to fit into the local context. So if you're putting something, um, you know, some, say, a microgrid, a solar microgrid in Rajasthan, in India, then, you know, it needs to be able to um, survive, you know, up to 38 or more, 38 degrees C. Um, if, um, if, you're, if you're dealing with an audience um, that has low to no literacy, it has to be simple. Um, if you, like I mentioned earlier, if if um, if you're if you're dealing with women and, and fetching water, then then the solution has to be lightweight. So it's really really important to be considering all of these design elements um, when you're putting a technology solution in place, and it's considering all of them in within the local context. Um, and you know, as you scale, um, that your local context can change, and so the question is do you want to continue, do you scale to places that are similar or do you want to, so that you can, don't have to change your technology? Or if you're going to scale to a place that is different, then um, you might have to you know, go back to your technology and, and reconsider re all of these elements again in order to make sure that, um, that it is appropriate. Now, the fact is that because of the audience that, um, as social entrepreneurs that we're dealing with, typically is in uh, the bottom of the pyramid, these solutions do need to be inexpensive. And, um, and so taking advantage of, of low-cost development platforms like mobile um, makes a lot of sense. And so we see a lot of, of our social entrepreneurs um, really delivering mobile solutions. And you know, if you look at, at the market, um, there's over uh, 6 billion uh, mobile subscribers today. But the thing to remember is that these are people, they, I mean, and I was just in Nairobi and in Uganda, I was in Nairobi a week ago and in Uganda and Nairobi um, in, in um, December and in, in, in India in November. Everyone's carrying around mobile phones, but they're not smartphones for the most part. They're feature phones. So again, you know, keeping the local context in mind um, is an important aspect. But like I said, you know, the, 
leveraging mobile apps is something that we're seeing many of our um, social enterprises doing. Um, LaborLink, for instance, is um, is uh, basically providing transparency of a supply chain in order to prevent human rights abuses. And so using a cell phone that a, a, that a worker, a laborer can, can um, you know, wage, uh, can t say uh, that they feel like they're being, you know, abused, that they're having to work too many hours or whatever, their conditions are, 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 not, are not safe. We have um, M Farm, um, which is using mobile devices so that um, smallholder farmers can get the prices of their crops, as well as they can report back on um, the volumes, the yield that they have, so that um, so that there can be linkages between um, what they're producing and then and, um, and uh, prospective buyers. And then you have um, Worldwide Hearing, for instance, is using mobile for, um, uh, for uh, monitoring and evaluation, being able to keep track of, of what's happening in, in the field. So, you know, like I said, you know, thinking about your technology in the context of, of, which, of where it's going to lead is, is, is critical. And we see mobile as being a huge component going forward um, in a variety of different ways. Um, um, in the social enterprise space. As I mentioned, um, human capital is a big barrier. And, uh, you know, you say, well, you know, Pamela, that's even true in Silicon Valley, here in New York City. I mean, it's true around the world. But in the social enterprise space, there are additional issues and, and, and additional uh, barriers that come up. Um, being able to find the right uh, founders and leaders is, is, is tricky. Um, but you know many of these people are living um, not they're you know they're living in around the world um, and so so that can be a barrier to attracting great talent um, for I've been working with um, one of our alumni's uh, livelihoods and they're looking for a development director and they've had two um, yeses um, people have said yes they would take the job but then they've then they've turned it down after having said yes and and you know, while it, their livelihoods is based in Nairobi, and so while you know initially there might be kind of an excitement about relocating to Nairobi, when when it comes down to it and real life steps in, then it becomes a challenge. Um, a lot of times, uh, m many of our social entrepreneurs are are working in rural areas. A lot of people don't want to be working in rural areas; they feel isolated. They want to be working in urban areas. So there's a level a, 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 a much bigger level of complexity around um, getting the right people and the right talent um, into these organizations, and then also making sure that they have board members that um, that are, are are working with them and really understand their business and and can be helpful and 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 working um, with um, and being strategic with these social entrepreneurs. Um, you know, as incubators and accelerators, we can do the best job we can in helping these folks figure out their business model and making sure that they've got the appropriate technology. But if they don't have the money, they're not going to be able to do the good work that they want to do. And so um, impact investing is something that is still very much um, in the early days. It used to be that investors were all they cared about was return and risk. And so now you see, if you will, a new breed of investors coming in and saying, OK, um, I'm willing to take lower returns and probably higher risk, uh, but I want to, uh, because I, I'm really uh, interested uh, in seeing impact. And so, you know, there's a number of reports that have come out um, on this. But like I said, it's still very, very early days um, in this field. And, and you know, we'll take a, taking a deeper look at this, you know, if you think about um, Silicon Valley and venture-backed companies, you know, it's a well-known universe. I mean, you, th there's VCs that focus, and everyone knows who they are, that focus on early stage, and those that focus on mid-stage, and those that focus on late stage. And um, they've worked with each other before, so they'll easily syndicate on deals. Um, there's a well-understood well path to go from a Series A to a Series B. And, and most importantly, there's lots of examples of round trips of capital that you know, money has been put into organizations, and then money has come out in terms of IPOs and mergers and acquisitions. And so 
like I said, this kind of a well-understood world. Whereas impact investing, like I said, is, is still very nascent and um, it's very, very challenging. Um, typically, you'll have an impact investor that is um, based in either North America or in Europe looking to do a deal in, you know, in a country that's probably you know, th thousands and thousands of miles away um, from them in a local context that they're not familiar with. And so this, what, what ends up happening is due diligence takes long, long, long time. And social entrepreneurs, you know, are constantly, you know, and, you know, if any of you have gone through due diligence, you know it's a painful process. And then going through that pain for nine months to a year and beyond, it's just, I mean, it just is, it's tedious, it's time consuming, and it's getting in the way of really doing what a social entrepreneur wants to do, which is creating impact. These also, there's not, you know, there's not a well understood, uh, you know, with people are just starting to syndicate now, working together, and we've seen very few um, exits in this space. And so, until we see more and more round trips of capital, it's going to be a challenge for people to really kind of get that appetite to be, um, you know, to be really heavy. Um, and the reality is that for most social entrepreneurs, equity is not the right play for them. Um, many of these social entrepreneurs are doing this because they want to be having an impact in their community. They're not looking to do an exit like any of our, you know, our, our Silicon Valley um, organizations are. You know, it's a family-run business oftentimes. So equity isn't the right play. And so one of the things that we've been doing at the center, we have an impact capital team that is, is really looking at, at this and, and looking at what other financial um, instruments can we put in the market so that these social entrepreneurs can get the capital that they need and, um, and then, and, but not have to do it in the form of equity. And so uh, one of the innovations that we've come up with is what we call the demand dividend, and it's in a pilot project right now. We've got it um, in Nicaragua and Mali um, and a couple of other countries. And what this is, is a, it's a debt vehicle that is very social entrepreneurship friendly. So what this does is um, a social entrepreneur can uh, 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 borrow money, and they first of all they have what we call a honeymoon period, so that for whatever is um, agreed to, you know, 12 months, 18 months, they don't have to pay any of it back. And then when the honeymoon period is over, then they start paying that back based on free cash flow. So they're not having to pay when, you know, if you know, period, um, they're only paying when they're making money. So if they're making money, then they'll pay back um, on, this, on, their, on this debt, on this loan, um, but they're not just having to pay out of pocket even if they're not making any money. So like I said, it's very uh, friendly towards social entrepreneurs, and it's a way for investors to, in, you know, come into an organization, um, uh, invest in that organization, get their money back, um, um, and then, and so there is that round trip of capital, and all of the ownership of the organization stays with the social entrepreneur. So it's a win-win-win for everyone um, uh, in in you know in play there. So as I mentioned, um, me measurement and metrics is a huge question um, around the space of of social entrepreneurship. And there's been, you know, there's a whole, you know, question about what do we measure, et cetera. And so um, IRIS, or the Impact Reporting and Invest Investing Standards, is an attempt to put some standards on measuring um, um, outcomes. And so, uh, and that's what's important is that, you know, rather than measuring outputs, what we need to be measuring as a sector is outcomes. So it's not good enough just to say, um, that you know you've kept children in school for an additional year or two years. Um, okay, so they're sitting in school. So what is it making a difference in the economic benefit? Are they economically benefiting over it? Are they learning additionally? So there, we have to get to, to the further step. I mean, it's okay to start to count you know, children in school or, or uh, you know, how many water filters we distributed, but is that making a difference? And so it becomes really, really complicated. Um, and so, like I said, IRIS is, is an attempt to kind of standardize this. And um, as you see here, 
um, at the time of this graphic was 463 organizations that are reporting. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we've, we, our alumni um, account for over 200, and I assure you there's way, way, way more than uh, 463 social under, uh, entrepreneurs and enterprises around the world. So there's still a lot of work to do here in, in order to, um, to bring everyone along. And to be honest with you, I, uh, you know, many of our social entrepreneurs complain about the fact that it's still really, it's really hard to report to IRA standards and such. So um, there's still a lot of work here to do, but it's really important work because if we can't prove our impact, then why are we doing this? I mean, we, we, we need to do that to be able to attract the kinds of capital that we need and, and, um, for these enterprises to grow. This graphic kind of, it will show you that, you know, it's still, there's some geographies that are doing better than others in terms of reporting, um, re reporting their metrics, but it's still, um, it's still a big challenge um, for, for the sector. And finally, um, the, uh, you know, we, we're talking about scaling, and so, so the question is, you know, what, what is the right way for these enterprises to scale? And the answer is, of course, there's no, um, no one way, I mean, no right way. There's lots of different ways, and, and ways that we're seeing um, that, ha that are starting to emerge. One is um, basically, you know, the first one, the multinational, you know, holding companies is what you see oftentimes in, in just in corporate America, where you have a headquarters maybe based in the U.S., but then you have, um, you know, social enterprise, uh, uh, say, well, it's just called like Vision Spring. So Vision Spring might have um, its headquarters in the U.S., but then it's got Vision Spring Kenya, Vision Spring uh, Tanzania and Vision Spring, Mexico, and so and each of these are different kind of different organizations underneath the the mother the mother umbrella or uh, mothership uh, of the enterprise. Um, so, like I said, that's kind of taking a book for from our page rather from the book that we see many uh, for-profit companies uh, go down. The other one which we're seeing to, uh, emerge is really exciting, um, and we're very really excited about kind of getting involved in in, in trying to make this work more efficiently is on this, what we call open source franchising or the rep, a replication uh, model. Um, we actually conducted a survey of about 30 social entrepreneurs whose business model we believed could, um, could be replicated to other geographies. And so we asked them, you know, would you be interested in doing that? And to, you know, to our surprise, over 75% said that they would want, you know, nothing more. They, that's what they wanted. They themselves actually didn't really have them an interest in, you know, if they're an Indian-based uh, uh, social enterprise doing business um, in some place in Africa, say in Nigeria, but they were more, more than happy to kind of, if you will, take everything that they're doing, kind of box it up and give it to a Nigerian social entrepreneur for them to do in Nigeria. And um, so this kind of open sharing and, and being able to replicate freely um, without, you know, the, these, the, the folks that we were talking to, they didn't want any financial re remuneration or anything. They were just really happy to be able to see that what they were doing was useful and could be taken to other, other countries and, and serve other communities, and they were all for it. So like I said, um, at the GSBI, we're looking to get more involved in this and figure out how we can do this and help social um, enterprises do this um, efficiently. Cooperatives is a, is a way that um, many of our social un enterprises um, that are dealing with artisans is a way that they're scaling. So they'll form cooperatives around different communities and, um, and then you know, so, and, and those communities are, are already used to working with each other. So it's a kind of a natural extension to, to, um, to the way uh, the communities are working. And then one that is um, just starting, and, and we'll see um, where this goes, is being able to, you know, outsource, if you will, um, some of the business functions that all social enterprises need to deal with, like um, accounting and you know, financial systems and such, so that using that as a way of um, getting their economies to scale um, is something that we're starting to see um, people playing with, and we'll see how that goes um, in the future. But like I said, there's, and there probably are some other models here, too, for scaling that we, we haven't thought of, and, and, um, but, uh, but it is something that um, a social entrepreneur needs to be thinking about and, think, and, 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 uh, you know, and 
figuring out what makes sense for them. So just like we work uh, with our social entrepreneurs and how to scale their business, um, the way that we're scaling GSBI is through replication. And um, what we're doing is we've, uh, we're working with mission-aligned organizations, and, um, and basically they take our content and they localize it and, 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 uh, and, and translate it if need be into other languages. And, and basically do, basically do this with their social entrepreneurs locally. And so we have um, eight uh, MOUs, Memorandums of Understanding, signed um, with organizations around the world um, that you can see here. And so, so this is the way that we've chosen to scale our, um, our own uh, uh, impact. And remember, I, I talked about getting to a billion positively impacting a billion lives by 2020. We're not going to be able to do that by ourselves sitting in, at Santa Clara University. And so this is a way for us um, to, to get, get there. So, you know, there are barriers um, to scaling. Uh, we talked about technology um, and the fact that and human capital, um, financial capital, the metrics and measurement, you know, being able to measure impact and then scaling models. Um, but the reality is that there's a lot of stuff going on and in the developing countries. And, you know, and they are leapfrogging us in terms of, of technologies and such. You know, many, a lot of those four billion people that we've, um, that we've been talking about won't ever see a landline. Um, they are all working with mobile devices. Um, the fact that, you know, the banks, um, many people, uh, you might have heard of M-Pesa in Kenya. Um, there's a lot of people in Kenya that don't touch money at all, or if they, if they do, um, they certainly don't have a bank, a bank account. Um, in Kenya alone, over 80% of the businesses are, are what, in we, what we call the informal economy. They're not registered uh, with, the, with the government. They don't have a bank account. And so they're using a peso. They're not, they're not doing um, traditional banking. Um, the, you know, we, we, we've talked about off-grid energy. There's a lot of stuff going on. Um, they're not going to, you know, the governments aren't going to be doing the, the um, laying the, the wires and, and, cell, and towers for electricity and such. Um, it's all going just straight to solar from, from no energy to solar um, and other, of course, other clean energy solutions too. And then manufacturing is being, is done, being done differently too with the advent of 3D printers. So there's a lot of these developing countries that are, are like I said, skipping this large need for infrastructure that we have just built and we expect to work here um, in, in, in the developed countries. Um, and, and so, you know, keeping that in mind as you're, as you're innovating um, in, from a, in the technology aspects um, is key. Um, but as I said at the beginning, it's, technology isn't just enough. You need to be thinking about having the appropriate business model and um, a deep understanding of the local context. So with that, I know I talked quite a bit and a lot and fast, and I apologize, but um, I wanted to leave some time for Q&A. So I will turn over um, the moderating back to Paul so that he can, um, take, uh, he can take your questions and we'll, we'll go from there. Thank you so much for your patience and, and listening. I do very much appreciate it. Pamela, thank you very much for that uh, brilliant overview. Um, you know, I think you covered a lot of ground and a, a lot of topics in, in great detail and, you know, really painted a picture of the, the, the social entre entrepreneurship ecosystem, which I think is, you know, a really good way to, to understand it and to understand um, where things are going. For everyone out there, there's a number of questions coming in, um, lots of questions, lots of interesting questions, but if you do have any questions that you'd like Pamela to address, if you could ask them in the Q&A um, aspect of your screen, that would be great. I want to start with um, uh, two, two questions that have, have, have come in from the network. Firstly, and I think this is, you know, a really interesting um, question regarding, um, 
you know, the recipients of these products and services, um, often referred to as the, you know, base of the pyramid consumers. Um, and just, I was wondering if you had an opinion or you could talk a little bit about, you know, what the value is in engaging um, base of the pyramid consumers um, as stakeholders in the business. So, you know, often they're seen as consumers, but there's a move at the moment to see them as as co-creators in product development. Um, you know, is that a trend that you see and is that something that you, you have an opinion on? Um, yes, absolutely. And so you, you might, some people might have heard the whole um, lean uh, principles, you know, a lean startup, the lean methodology, and that's certainly what's being done in um, in Silicon Valley and and in technology, software technology companies. But I also see it uh, with social entrepreneurs that they're that they are working with their customers and they're iterating quickly um, with with the products and getting feedback. Um, and so that's why you know it's it's really critical, like I said, to be doing this in the local context. Um, and so w being wherever you're your customers are um, that you wish to serve, um, you need to be on the ground with them and, and really, um, you know, working with them very closely in order to make sure that, you know, if, you, if we go back to remembering that slide um, around thinking about the appropriate technology and what that means in all aspects, um, uh, and, and you're going to need to do that with your customers in a very iterative um, and, and rapid uh, cycle. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, some more questions coming in. Um, this is a, a, a very good question, I think, that, that, that's come in from Europe. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of budding and social entrepreneurs out there, but it's a very difficult thing to take the first step. You know, for, for budding social entrepreneurs on the call, what's the first step that you can take in order to, you know, to make your idea a reality? Well, you know, there's um, so assuming that you have an idea and and such, I think there's there's places to go. There's challenges. There's there's a lot of challenges that are being run constantly, um, and uh, I you know I can't even rattle some of them off my, the top of my head right at this moment. But I would um, encourage you to to search around um, um, the websites around uh, social entrepreneurship and and see that these challenges are sometimes they're like you know uh, you know run across like a weekend, but then some of them are run across months. Um, where there's some training, so basically they ha they kind of go through a, a training with you to kind of tease out what your idea is and and make some you know some sense around the business model and things like that. And then at the end, um, people are selected and you know and, and often uh, are given some you know see some money. It could be you know ten thousand dollars, you know it could be fifty thousand dollars, and I've seen some challenges up into the millions of dollars. So. So that would be a, a way um, to get started. Wonderful, thank you. I think that gives a you know a, a, a good uh, suggestion on how to break down this what is a you know a big challenge and seems very grandiose to begin with into into simple small steps. There's a there's a question come in that has re relating to uh, financial returns and you know I like this one because I'm really a, a, a business guy even though I always focus on social entre entrepreneurs, I think that it's very important to think about why people are investing and what they're getting out of investing in social entrepreneurs. So could you talk a little bit more about, you know, what what type of returns are investors looking for when they're in, investing in, in, in social entrepreneurs? Yeah, so, um, you know, some of this is changing as, as, we're, as we're getting <laughs> a bit older and wiser um, in the space. You know, initially the idea, the thought was, you know, the returns could come in three to five years, and and it could be, you know, um, seven to nine times, and and now we're realizing it's not three to five years. It's probably more likely to be five to seven, or even beyond seven years um, to to get returns, and and it's maybe you know, three to five times. So, so like I said, you know, the expectations have shifted over time, and who knows um, how they'll continue to shift. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, there's been very, very few um, exits. I mean, if you think about, 
you know, you know, so certainly there's been people will point to well, you know, there's some MFI exits, but I would, I would submit that um, the M MFIs are are a different beast in terms of 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 social entrepreneur or social enterprises um, than most social enterprises. I mean, there's um, a clear financial piece of that, and and uh, so so it's easier to to uh, you know to uh, value that and such that rather than a solar lighting company, for instance. So um, so as we start to see some more of the it's more of these exits, then I think the um, expectations will adjust again. Yeah, fantastic. So just to, to summarize your your answer there, you know, I think the people who are investing are looking for a financial return out of their investment, but they're also looking for social return and environmental return. And I guess the difference between a social investor or an impact investor and a regular investor is the added social return that we're looking for and perhaps also the patience in which they're expecting to, to get their return back. Is that a fair comment? Yes, I mean, and that's exactly what we also talk about, Paul, is, is, is about patient capital. It's, you know, it, it, if you're, you can't be in here for the short term and expect, you know, money back in three years. I mean, it's very, very, very unlikely. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. There's a, there's a very, there's a specific question come in in terms of wash, um, in terms of water and sanitation, and I'm going to take the opportunity to answer that if you don't mind, Pamela, and just do a shameless plug for our next webinar, um, which is actually in, in collaboration with the Water Institute at UNC at the University of North Carolina. And I think that if you're interested in WASH, that's a really good place to start. If you go to their website and look at the things, some of the things they're doing, they have a conference each year called WASH Tech, uh, which is very interesting. And, and as I say, if you want to participate in our March webinar, that's exactly what um, that will be about in terms of household water treatment products and standards, and more generally the, the, the wash arena. So I think that that's a, a good question and a good opportunity to, to participate next time. There's also an organization which I personally love um, called the World, the World Toilet Organization, the, the other WTO, um, and they're doing some great work in, in, in water and sanitation. So that's a, a good place for you to look. Pamela, um, a question that, that I often get asked, um, which I'd really be interested to, to hear your insights in on. Uh, you know, from your perspective, where you sit, you obviously have a great network around the world, and you see emerging technologies and an emerging challenges. Are there are there some areas or markets um, that you see a, that are particularly growing quickly at the moment that would, would be a good opportunity um, either from a need perspective or from a, a you know a demand perspective yeah so there are um, so if I look at our over 200 um, alumni I'd say that uh, about 45 or, or so of them uh, are in India and there's a lot of need in India and, and there's a lot of activity in India as well. Um, there are a number of incubators and accelerators there. There's a, a lot of money being put in there. Actually, um, if you're interested, I do know that the World Bank um, has um, applications open right now for their development marketplace, um, of which that's another place. Basically, you have to have um, a, a social enterprise uh, and then commit to doing work in, for the poorest states. And, um, and they'll support you um, with, um, I'm going to say $100,000. That might not be exactly right, but it's a significant amount of money. Um, and so, so India is a place, and the other place is uh, Nairobi and, and Kenya. Um, like I said, I was in Nairobi uh, last week and then in, in December and then actually last June. And there's just a lot of bubbling around that's going on. The whole ecosystem is is supported there. I mean, they have, they do have impact investors. So I mentioned earlier that typically impact investors are found in North America and in Europe, but there are impact investors in countries as well. And, um, and certainly uh, Nairobi, there's a lot in, uh, of, of impact investors in Nairobi, and then social entrepreneurs and incubators and accelerators and, and co-working space. And 
So there's kind of a, a real um, energy um, uh, there. And from there, you're not only supporting Kenya, but a lot of those organizations are supporting all of East Africa. So Uganda, Tanzania, um, at least, and then you know, some, some going into Rwanda and such. So I would say Thanks. that both. Yeah, so I'd just say that both of those um, those areas are where we see a kind of a hotbed of activity. Yeah, and just to add to that, I know that USAID has their Development uh, Ventures Initiative, which has certain challenges that they're trying to solve. That there is like a call to action or competition for social entrepreneurs out there. So the USAID. Development Ventures Initiative is, a, is another place where, where people can look for, for emerging market trends. Uh, just, just for the, the, the last question, and I think this is a really good way to, to, to finish, given the, given the nature of the audience on the line and given that it's engineering for change, uh, there's a question regarding the importance of human capital. Um, for social entrepreneurs and building that capacity. You know, obviously, we often try and focus on technology solutions and the importance of technology. But clearly, human capital is, is key um, to, to, to building and scaling um, social enterprises. So I don't know if you've got any, any reflections on some of, the, some of the ways in which GSBI have been able to instill that perspective into the people they work with. Well, I mean, I take it even, you know, so with the GSBI, you know, we work with social entrepreneurs that are already um, doing, you know, in, in countries or in business and, and have something, like I said. But, you know, even start, starting before then, um, being able to, I know a number of universities, Santa Clara, uh, Penn State, have a, a big focus on engineering for the developing world. And... So, you know, for those that are in school or are or, or considering going back to school, that um, looking for um, um, uh, institutions that have a thrust in those, in those areas, I think, is important because, you know, it, like I said earlier, I mean, engineering for these different, for making sure that the, the technology is appropriate is, is, is important. And so, um, Getting going to institutions that support that, that really understand that, that actually oftentimes you will go out into the field and do field work um, uh, with those programs. So that's a way to even get started earlier in your in in your career, so to speak. Um, and so then you know then I think that it's there's a lot of of, of um, um, uh, you know, um, uh, workshops and things like that that can help you um, just become a better social entrepreneur um, and make sure that you're you know constantly learning because there's this this field is con is changing a lot you know I've been a mentor for the GSBI I started as a mentor um, six years ago now and uh, what was happening then is very different than what's happening now so being able to stay on top of trends and making sure that you're doing that I think is uh, is important too and and then and the one thing because I mean I used to work in the private sector you know and we were always you know very close we weren't sharing I mean and, but the social enterprise space is very much a, I, it, I love the fact that you know, people are willing to share they're willing to to convene and get together and 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 you know make sure that all of all of all of you are are, are moving forward. So I would encourage you to be networking and such too with others um, because uh, the, it really is a very friendly um, uh, environment. Wonderful, Pamela. Thanks. Thanks for that. That answer, and I think you know it's a good way to finish because it's such an interesting way in which this community is evolving, and which the interdisciplinary nature of the community brings together people from all walks of life, and it's that communication and collaboration between those different viewpoints that really end up making su successful solutions. So thanks very much for your time today. I think you know you gave us an excellent overview of the space. And I know I personally found it very interesting. And I'm sure the other 100 participants online um, we equally enjoyed it. Thanks, every, everyone, for your questions and your comments.
Um, as I mentioned, uh, EPUSC is a community and a network that is, is fantastic for you to join if you're not already a member. And then please join us for future webinar series, in the, in, in, first of all in March, and then we have them, them every month. Um, in case you're, you need your professional development code, the code's on the screen now. If you have any more questions, please don't hesitate to uh, reach out to us at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Um, and again, thanks very much to Pamela Rosas um, from uh, the Global Social Benefit Incubator at Santa Clara University. Thank you.